All right, I'm just going to read Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. The parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Thank you, Emily. This parable has been called various things. Uh, the rich fool, the rich farmer, the greedy farmer, the man God called a fool, the parable of the damned fool. I call it how to live life for dummies. <laughs> I hope that will make a bit more sense later. It's an interesting context. It's sort of bookended between two passages that are about not worrying. The first one saying, do not worry. You are loved and valued. Every hair on your head is numbered. They're now incident. And then afterwards, it actually says, therefore, do not worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. Life's much more important than that. Consider the lilies of the field, the birds of the air. God cares for them and he cares for you much more. So someone yells out, Teacher, tell my brother to divide our inheritance. What's going on here? Well, for generations they've had a law, primogeniture, which means that the firstborn gets double. Just thinks that's good. <laughs> um, so if you've got two sons, the inheritance is divided into three portions, two of which go to the eldest and one goes to the younger. Now, who do you think is singing out not happy about that? <laughs> this is the younger son, brother, who wants Jesus to tell his big brother to share things evenly. So what does it mean? Well, his dad's just died. And what's he worried about? Getting his hands on the loot. Can't wait to get the stuff. Jesus responds, man, some translate it friend, because the Greek's a little bit softer, warmer than the English um, implies. Who made me your judge? It sounds a bit rhetorical. You know, when someone tells you what to do and you say, who made you the boss? We're not really asking. Uh, in fact, the message translates Jesus' statement, what makes you think that's any of my business? But what if it's not rhetorical? Remember when they said to him, good teacher, and he said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. He actually wanted them to think about it. What if he wants them to think about this? Who made me your judge? Who did make him the judge? God did. What if, as the judge, he's about to give a really important tip on life? He's the one who's going to judge a life as either a success or a failure. And here is how to do it right. So he launches into a little caution about greed because life's not about getting more and more stuff. And then he tells the story. So a guy owns some land, that's great. It's a fertile land, that's wonderful. It yields abundant crops, that's how God designed it. More than he needed, that's still okay. He built bigger barns, that could still be okay. Remember Joseph in Egypt? How many millions did he save by storing up? But where did he go wrong? It was all for himself, wasn't it? That's where it went wrong. Now we've got a problem. And tonight your time is up. Your life is called to account. 
Fool sounds a bit harsh, doesn't it? A little bit mean. What does the word mean? Well, the Greek word is a phron, a meaning without, phron meaning sense or reason or wisdom. So literally to have no sense, to be ignorant. We might say stupid. Or what about dummy? It's not getting much nicer. Is it? <laughs> but how did he say it? With what motive? How does God feel about someone who's stuffed up? Missed the boat, lost the plot. Um, it's heartbreaking for him, isn't it? If you think about it, here's a precious eternal soul made for life with God, lost his way, got distracted, missed the point. There really isn't a bigger tragedy. So maybe he's saying it with sadness, longing rather than malice. Well, here comes the tip from the judge himself. So it is for the one who stores up stuff for himself and is not rich towards God. The message says that's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not God. <laughs> the living says, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. There are lots and lots of ways to get life wrong. So it is with someone who chases after popularity, fame, um, money, uh, but is not rich towards God. You could insert the, the error there that you like. It could be something much more appealing to us. So it is with someone who does good things, uh, who pursues social justice, who whatever, but is not rich towards God. You want to live a life that is right, according to the judge, be rich towards God. You want the judge to say, well done, be rich towards God. Well, how can anyone possibly be rich towards God? He owns everything, doesn't he? Everything was made by him, for him, in him, it's all his. So how can we possibly be rich towards God? Any ideas? So he's actually given us a gift, free will, and we can really do what we want, can't we? We can turn that free will back on ourselves, or we can turn it back towards God. Yeah? That free will is a gift. Any other ideas about how we can be rich? Love. 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 Yeah, love is an opportunity, isn't it? We can take our love and turn it inward or turn it outward, upward. We get to choose whether we love, who we love, how we love. And he generally doesn't intervene, does he? We can decide to love our cat, leave our whole inheritance to our cat. And the Lord generally lets that stand and God lets it stand. What else is? There's another area that could be, Andrew, is um, God gives us that free will of choice. And so what he decided to do was what was going to benefit him. So he made the decision to benefit himself. What if he had said gone to God and said, God, what do you want me to do with this extra? Do you want me to build barns? Do you want me to give it away, etc.? Yes. So. The abundance was a test of his character, wasn't it? If he had gone to God and said, wow, God, you've given me this. It's really yours, but you've sort of loaned it to me. I wonder what you'd like me to do with it. So we haven't got crops, barns, have we? Sort of do, don't we? We've got stuff. And God actually loans it to us, doesn't he? So we've got stuff. You can do stuff with it. We helped friends move this week and rang up Al and said, Al, you've got a ute. <laughs> How many times have we called Al and said, Al? <laughs> Why do we do that? Because every time we've asked, Al has come through with whatever he's gotten. And away we go on the adventure. 
So our stuff is loaned to us to see what we do with it. And it's an opportunity to show character or the lack of it. What else? So our stuff, our will, our love. Our time. Yeah, you really do have this moment today. He's given it to you on loan to see what you do with it. You can't save it. It's got to be spent. You can lie in bed. You're still spending it. <laughs> you can misspend it. You can spend it on yourself. Or you can give it back to God. So our time today is on loan to us. Our stuff, our will, our intent, our focus, our affection, they're all loaned to us. And what does it mean to be rich to God? Invest them back into Him and His kingdom and His people. Invest it back in what matters. So, how to be rich towards God? Let me suggest it's all about taking what He has loaned you and investing it back into what matters. We probably all notice that when we take our time and attention and our affection and our stuff and turn it back on ourselves, it makes us miserable. Rich people generally are miserable, demanding, critical, grumpy, self-absorbed. It's a recipe for an unhappy, miserable existence. But we've also noticed that when we are self-emptied, when we give it back to God, gladly, like Romans 12 says, everyday acts of worship, then we've stumbled upon a secret. It's a secret to joy, not the fleeting good feeling of retail therapy or a nice meal, but deep joy, the joy of the presence and the power of God in our life. This guy wants Jesus to tell his brother to give him some more stuff. Jesus wants him to invite him into his life so that he doesn't have to grieve his dad on his own. He wants to rescue him from a miserable life. He's lost his dad, now he's fighting with his brother, his only brother. You see what selfishness does? It sort of takes and takes and takes and spoils. Jesus would love him to get on to real life. Paul knows all about the dangers of chasing wealth and money. First Timothy says people who chase after wealth are falling in a trap and it sort of takes them down into ruin. And that's the context for the verse about godliness with contentment is great gain. And then he has a passage of advice to the rich. That's you and me, in case you're wondering. Even though my second-hand Toyota parks between a custom Porsche and a vintage Jaguar, we are wealthy. Here's his instruction to us. If you do find yourself to be wealthy, don't trust in that stuff. You check your bank balance, whoa, $3 million. It's like, uh, wow, it's still there, yes. Be really easy to trust in that stuff. Something happens, you think, no worries. Got money in the bank. Super easy when you've got that stuff to trust in it. Don't trust in that stuff. But use it. Use it to do good. In fact, be rich in good works, he says. Give to those who are in need. Always be ready to share what God's given you. That posture, like Al with his youth, he's ready. He's expectant. He's eager to jump in uh, and to use what God has given him. In this way, Paul says, if you can do this, then you are grasping real life. If you've been able to do this, then you're dodging the trap and you are on track with real life. Well, how are we going? Reinvesting what he's loaned us. A Christian counselor once said, don't tell me what your priorities are. Simply bring your calendar, your diary and your bank statements and I'll tell you what your priorities are. What do you think of that? So we look at someone's diary and it says, oh, they went to church and they went to community kitchen and they helped someone move. Okay, that person's obviously walked with God that day. What if they sat in church miserable and grumpy? What if they resented every part of that, those activities? They missed the point, didn't they? What if the calendar says, oh, someone went to the pub? Clearly they didn't walk with God that day. So the calendar doesn't tell you the motive, does it? What about the bank balance? 
Scripture says God loves a cheerful giver. So it's not just the giving, it's our attitude that really matters. You give begrudgingly, resentfully, um, then you sort of put a poison into the act itself. So there is some truth in that, but it doesn't tell us about motive, and I think motive really matters. Motive can make all the difference. You ever reflected at the end of the day and wondered whether that was a good day or not? What makes a day good? Really tempting to think through your to-do list. How much did I get done? Do you realise God's to-do list for today is really very short? What does he want to do? He wants to share your experiences with you. And he wants to shine out through you to a dark world. That's a pretty short list, isn't it? Quite simple, really. Anything that gets in the way of that is bad. And anything that enhances it is good. It's pretty straightforward definitions, no. Church gets in the way of that, that just became bad for you. Going to the pub helped. You can imagine, maybe. <laughs> Money, possessions, stuff, they're not good or bad in themselves. They can be a trap, take you down to destruction, they make a lousy master, or they can be assets in the master's hands. Okay, remember when we started parables, we said parables are not for your entertainment, they're not for your edification, they're not even just for your enlightenment. What are they for? They are for your application. Go back and find the tape if you haven't heard. They are meant to be put on the road. Take them for a spin. See how they go. They're meant to be acted on. They're meant to be applied. Okay, so application. How can I possibly be rich towards God? What have I said? Reinvest what he's loaned you. Your time. Your talents your stuff back into what matters. What matters? Well, what lasts? People last, don't they? Grow the family. Love the family. Add to the family. While you're doing that, your attitude matters. Make sure that you're sharing your experiences with him. Trying to keep empty of self so that he can shine out without self getting in the way. There's a quote by um, the famous British journalist Malcolm Mugridge, uh, writer, thinker, um, actually introduced the West to Mother Teresa, so quite a figure in the 20th century. You might have heard it before. I may, I suppose, regard myself as a relatively successful man. People occasionally stare at me in the streets. That's fame. I can fairly easily earn enough to qualify for admission to the highest ranks of the internal revenue. That's success. Furnished with money and a little fame, even the elderly, if they want to, can partake of trendy diversions. That's pleasure. It might happen once in a while that something I said or wrote was sufficiently heeded for me to persuade myself that I've represented a significant impact on my time. That's fulfilment. Yet I say this to you and beg you to believe me. Multiply these tiny triumphs a million times. Add them all together. And they're nothing, less than nothing. A positive impediment measured against one draught of that living water that Christ offers to the spiritually thirsty, irrespective of who they are. We could probably, less eloquently maybe, come up with our own list, couldn't we? Stuff that people might think are achievements, but they're really pale in importance, don't they? To the beautiful experience of sharing life with Jesus. Someone looking at your life, would they get the idea that you value the living water like that? There are many, many ways to get life wrong, chasing the dollar in this example. Jesus, the judge who says what goes, says if you really want to live, don't worry about all that stuff. You are valued and loved. And that's the context, isn't it? Do not worry, you are valued and loved. Live life, do not worry because he cares for you. The context really matters. Gladly, knowing that he loves you, that he's in control, hand back what he's loaned you. Share your life with him today, and he will shine out through you. 
I'm going to do communion a little differently. I'll get my helpers to hand out the stuff, but maybe just where we are, if we want to take some time to pray, think about what he's loaned you today, your stuff, your gifts, your talents. And if you haven't today, just invest them back. Tell him they're his. Let's do that together.